Greetings, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part six of the Isaiah series. One thing I missed, though, was that um, on Isaiah 5, on the uh, IsaiahMiniBible.com, is that uh, in Isaiah 5, 1 and 5, 2, it said, My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Um, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Well, on uh, chapter 5 corresponds of Isaiah corresponds with book number five of the Bible, which is Deuteronomy. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 32, Deuteronomy 32, 32, what does it say about the vineyard? For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. And what did they give Christ on the cross? Vinegar mingled with gall, right? So when he took our sin, dying on the cross, well, there you go. All right, go to Isaiah chapter 6. We are going to do the next chapter. This is not a particularly long one. Now, if you have listened to my Bible study on the Godhead, now people will argue and say, oh, well, Trinity, that's a, that's a, that's not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible's not in the Bible either. I mean, come on, people. You know, Trinity is not in the Bible, but the word Godhead is. Once I read Isaiah 6, and then I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 4, and then I'm going to do a study on, a brief study on the Godhead proving that man was made in God's image. And man has a, set, a distinct and separate body, soul, and spirit. And even if you're not a, a person that doesn't like Paul, it doesn't matter. I can prove it from the Old Testament that man has a body that's different from his soul, that's different from his spirit. And God said, let us make man in our image. Um, Elohim is a plural noun. So, without further ado, let's go hit Isaiah chapter 6. Now, Isaiah chapter 6 corresponds roughly with the sixth book of the Bible which is Joshua. And uh, there's a whole lot of people that'll tell you, well, you know, that's not how the Jews pronounce that name. They say Yeshua or Yahshua. Uh, personally, I think they mispronounce words on purpose so that we don't know this is our book. This is our heritage. But... Um, Six. What is what about the number six? You know, you, you got six six six, right? So let's take a look in Revelation chapter thirteen and eighteen. Uh, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score, which is 60, and six. So 666, 666. What day was 
Adam man created. I say the sixth day. Um, I have people argue and say, no, no, no. Adam was a special creation. He was created on the eighth day. I don't think so. But, you know, that's... Uh, I think he was created on the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, God rested. And then on the eighth day, uh, God carried on the story in Genesis. But, you know, that's, that's how I look at it. And when you read man, you're reading the word Adam, A-D-A-M, which is actually Hebrew for a racial description. It means to show blood in the face reddish ruddy uh, I had a Strong's Concordance that I bought in the 80s well actually early uh, like around I bought it in 1990 but it was printed in the 80s and it had that and then I bought a, a newer one that had been printed in the 2000 something or others and it totally destroyed it got rid of that meaning totally got got rid of it and it just said Adam the first man you know, didn't say anything about being ruddy. Um, so, got rid of that. Well, actually, I don't think it was a book. I think it was um, online. So, all right. So, six has reference to man. Sixth chapter of Isaiah has reference to the sixth book in the Bible, which is Joshua. Now remember something, in 1 Timothy 3.16, and we'll get with that, we'll read it again, um, it says that God was manifest in the flesh. What does Emmanuel mean? Emmanuel, God with us. All right, so let's read Isaiah chapter 6 and get going, because I don't want to make this a 20-hour Bible study. Verse 1, Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So, obviously, a seraphim is a type of angel. Unless, of course, you know any men that have six wings and can fly. I don't know of any, so I'm assuming they're angels. Verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Why would they say this word three times? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Think about that. Uh, we're going to go back to that. Matter of fact, let's take a look right now. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and do a cross-reference. Verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. 
and I've mentioned before, I think the 20 and 4 elders are the 12 apostles, including Paul, and, um, and the 12 tribes of Israel. That's my educated guess. If you disagree, that's fine. You know, I could be wrong. Boy, if I, I'm an expert on being wrong. Uh, but it's, I'm mostly talking about non-biblical things. So, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. You know, isn't that what uh, was on the mount when Moses went up to the mount to get the, uh, when the Lord was going to give him the Ten Commandments? There was lightnings and thunders. Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's what you have when you have the Lord there, right? And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a, as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, just like the seraphim, right? But instead of calling them seraphim, they're calling them beast. Beast is not necessarily a derogatory term. So, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Just like we read in Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy. Verse 9. And when the beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne that liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Well, who does the Bible say created all things? Christ, if you have a King James. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah 6. And um, let's go to verse 2. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off, off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. All right, so let's read this again in verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Where do we read something about that? 
Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Okay, everybody, you know, everybody loves to argue and tell me, oh, this is talking about a man, the king of Tyrus, a human being. Verse 13 calls a different story, though. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Did the king of Tyrus, did, 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 did he, is he really um, hundreds and hundreds of years old that he was in the garden of God? I don't think so. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day, was prepared in thee, in the day that thou wast created. Created, not born. So this King of Tyrus was in Eden, the Garden of God, and he was created, not born. So who is this? Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Who is the anointed cherub that covereth? I think it was Lucifer himself. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, it has two angels with their wings facing toward each other. You know, you could take a look at Indiana Jones where the the angels' wings were facing each other covering the mercy seat, which is what, where the Lord sat upon. Um, at least that's how I see it. I could be wrong. But uh, I think Lucifer himself was one of the anointed cherubs that covered the mercy seat. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Ah, what human being has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire? The stones of fire. What did what did the angel just take? A coal, a C O A L, a coal, and touched Isaiah's lips with. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, not born. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity, sin, evil, wickedness, till iniquity was found in thee. Oh, yeah. Back to Isaiah 6.6. 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, a live coal, the burning stones, right? And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Wow. Well, you know, uh, let me tell you something, people. We're going to be baptized. In Matthew, verse 3 and 11, John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water. And there's people and churches. Uh, I think it's a church of God, the Campbellites, they call them, that uh, teach you got to get water baptized, otherwise you're not saved. Oh, you got to get water baptized. I mean... I'm not saying it's not important, you know, I, getting baptized is, to me, you know, it's a physical act, but they teach that you actually have to get dunked in the water, otherwise you're not saved. Uh, 
Did the thief on the cross get baptized in water? I don't think so. Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire. Yep, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to baptize those in him with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Isn't that what just happened here in Isaiah 6 and verse 6? Having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Yep, our sins are going to be purged. They're going to be burned up. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, I'm sorry, here am I, send me. Yeah, I could kind of understand that. You know, I didn't want to, uh, I never wanted a, a teaching ministry, I guess you could say. I never wanted it. Because I'm telling you people, Every single word that somebody teaches in the name of the Lord, they're going to have to give an account thereof. Some of these pe preachers, I just don't, I just don't know how. What, how they're not going to be able. How are they going to be able to stand in that day when they have to give an account? I mean, I've seen so much false teachings. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses in the uh, early 70s were saying that, well, the world's going to end by 1975, 76, or whatever. I forget the exact year. I think it was 75. And uh, they said, oh, Christ will come back. Well, he didn't. And too bad the Jehovah's Witness members didn't look at what the Bible said about stoning false prophets. Because they should have taken the entire group of elders that put out that filth and stoned them to death. And then if the state bothered to arrest them, they should have got a jury that said, but the Bible says to do it. Not guilty, Your Honor. But uh, Harold Camping, anybody? If that name comes to mind, he, he picked uh, the end of the world at least once. Uh, even Jesus didn't know what day he would return, but Harold Camping did. So I guess he knew more than Jesus, at least until the date came and passed. Yeah. Boy, I tell you what. Lord had to drag me into doing this stuff, kicking and screaming, because I didn't want to do it. But, you know, what are you going to do? Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Do we find a parallel thing to that in the Bible? In Matthew 13, verse 10, and the disciples came and said unto Jesus, unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore, Speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they do not hear, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. 
For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see in your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Isaiah 6 and verse 9. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, and perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. I'm telling you people, the Old Testament ties right into the New Testament. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth. What's a tenth? A tithe. That's kind of like his remnant. But yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return, and shall be eaten as a tell tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. The holy seed. We're not talking about plants. Uh, may I suggest you read Ev Ezra the book of Ezra, chapter 9, about the holy seed. All right. In, let's see, in Isaiah 6, 8, we read, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Is there a parallel account in the sixth book of the Bible, which is Joshua? Sure is. Uh, chapter 1 of verse 16. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. And then, in Isaiah 6, 11, Then said I, Lord, how long? Now remember, Judah's getting ready to go into captivity, or was going into captivity or had gone into captivity. I'm not exactly sure of the timeline. And then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without men, and the land be utterly desolate. So I'm thinking this is getting ready to happen. Now, Joshua 1, uh, no, I'm sorry, Joshua 11 and verse 8. Now remember, uh, Moses took them up to the, the border of the promised land, but he wasn't allowed to cross the river to go into the promised land. He saw it, but he didn't go into it because he struck the rock twice. He was disobedient. So Joshua and Caleb was one of the two spies that looked out the land uh, and said, yep, we can take this with the Lord's help, basically, paraphrasing. But the other ten spies, uh, they were scared, and they says, oh, we can't do this. There's giants. There's Goliath. We can't do this. They didn't have the faith. You know, King David had faith when he uh, stood against Goliath, right? So Joshua took over for Moses. And Joshua has reference to the word Savior. So, Joshua 11, 8. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, and they smote them until they left them, none remaining. Uh, 
I'm skipping around a little bit. Verse 11. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe. 12. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them. Verse 14. And all the spoil these cities and the cattle and the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe. You know what, people? Let me tell you something. These were the Canaanites. They were the satanic hybrids. And um, of Genesis 6 that happened after the flood. Sons of God. Daughters of men. The sons of God in Job 38 shouted for joy at the foundation, the creation of the earth. Adam didn't come until six days after the earth. Therefore, the sons of God have to be angels. There's no other... It's inescapable. All right, so let's take a look. Um, I hope I proved my point. Let's go take a look. Why did the Lord say... Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, why did the seraphims, the beasts of Revelation 4, why did they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty? Well, like I said, Trinity is not a Bible word, but Godhead is. So are the body, the soul, and the spirit are they the same thing? Here's questions for a so-called Pentecostal oneness or a watchtower Jehovah's witless devotee. You see, when they deny that God has three parts, okay, remember, man was made in God's image. Man has a body, soul, and spirit. When they deny that God is three in one, they're basically denying that Jesus is God come in the flesh. And then they'll take the Holy Spirit and turn that into a, the force. Luke, I am your father. Uh, that's for you Star Wars devote, you know, people. Uh, they want you to think that the Holy Spirit is just a force, like electricity. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. When, we're, when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're like plugging ourselves into the wall socket and the light comes on. Uh, I don't think so, but uh, there's people that actually teach that. And um, I'm sure they'll lead you down to the path of hell if you let them, you know. So let's take a look at some things about the Godhead. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 If you believe Paul, uh, this nails it right here, and you don't need the rest of the uh, study, but I'll go through it anyways. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, um, you know, whole, W-H-O-L-L-Y, that means complete, uh, and I pray God your whole spirit, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says spirit and soul and body. All right, let's go to the Old Testament, Isaiah ten eighteen, and shall consume the glory the gl ugh. And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. Both soul and body. And they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. So the body and soul are different. Let's go to Matthew 10, 28. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Ah! Now, if you don't believe Jesus, uh, 
you got a problem. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And who's that? Well, that's the Lord. Isaiah 26, 9. With my soul, with my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So soul and spirit are different. How about Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Now, what's the joints and marrow? Well, it's talking about uh, marrow is what is inside your bones. So when it talks about your joints and marrow, it's talking about your body. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints. And we're not talking about weed here. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Bible alone teaches that man has a body and a soul, and a spirit. Three parts make one man. Period. In Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us, plural, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 27, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So, Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, murder, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So if one man is body, soul, and spirit, and is three parts, and if God has made man in his image, how many parts is God? Well, duh, three. So how could Jesus do all those miracles if he was not God in the flesh? Well, there's a whole group of people that'll tell you that he was just a master of magic, that he did his power by the power of the devil, which is the unpardonable sin. And I guess I'll cover that briefly. But let's, before we do, let's go to 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, see, this isn't even controversial. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Body and spirit, right? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, I'm going to cover this in the next chapter, but I'm going to cover it again because we're on this theme. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so-called Bible scholars will tell you, well, you know, that word virgin really means a young woman. Well, guess what? I think there was a, if memory serves me correctly, there was a five-year-old in South America that got pregnant. 
a five-year-old. I think it was the case of the youngest woman that ever gotten pregnant. Matter of fact, she's still alive. You want proof of that? Let's take a look. All right, her name was Lena Medina. Lena Marcela Medina de Huardo. She was from Peru. She was born on the 23rd of September, 1933. She, got, she gave birth at five years old, seven months, and 21 days. She's still alive, people. This is the youngest confirmed mother in history. Can you imagine that? Uh, she was five years old, seven months, and 21 days when she gave birth. And there are devils that will tell you that uh, this thing about a virgin, no, 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 that just means a young woman. So was this woman, um, was she, um, was it a miracle? No, I think she had some help when she got pregnant. So, um, yeah, I'm being very facetious there. You know, people that don't believe the word virgin. Yeah. Matthew one twenty three. Behold, a virgin, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. See, these people will try to destroy the virgin birth because guess what? Sin fell upon all all men. That's why the virgin birth is so important. And then they try to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. You know, Satan's tricky, people. But you know what? I've been doing this. I've been reading the book for 30 years now, almost half my life. Um, I may not have the spiritual discernment that I need, but one thing I do know is this book because I've had some good teachers in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 we read for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God well does that mean that Christ sinned it says for all for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and these are the same people that will tell you well God wants all people to be saved well, if all means all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, does that apply to Christ? I don't think so. In Hebrews 4.15, we read, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ was the high priest yet without sin. Christ did not have sin. The Bible says for all have sinned, but Christ didn't have sin. That's why the virgin birth was so important. Mary's DNA that was tainted with sin wasn't involved. I mean, Christ had the same mother and father of, as Adam. Matter of fact, Christ is called the last Adam. In Romans 5.12, we read, Therefore, as by one man, Adam, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This is why the virgin birth is so important, people, because the Lord in his physical flesh bypassed the sin that was passed upon Adam and Eve unto all their children. Uh, listen to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. This is why they hate Paul. Paul, Paul makes ties everything together. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And so it is written, the first Adam, the first man Adam, the first man Adam was made a living soul. Remember God uh, 
formed him of the earth, breathed into his nostrils, and he became a living soul? Okay. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, the last Adam, well, if there's a first and then there's a last, well, that means there's more than one. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Christ was the last Adam. Adam didn't have a mother and father, and Christ did not have an earthly mother or father. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, I've got an in, in, in more in-depth Bible study on this if you're interested. In John 1, 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God. He, from the beginning, he was, was God. He didn't become a God. He was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Let's go to Revelation 1. Verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the voice of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Christ is the beginning, Christ is the end. He created Adam, and he is the last Adam. He's the first, and he's the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So there you go, people. I hope you learned something. I hope I tied it together well. Uh, and I'm hoping to uh, finish this series. This is almost 10% uh, of the book of Isaiah. I know I've been cranking them out, but uh, time is short. And you got to have a lot of... you got to know a, a lot of knowledge and wisdom and the Spirit of the Lord to stand for what's coming. Things are going to get bad. So, and if you're a sheep, just remember, things are going to get bad. All right. All blessing, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All glory and honor and praise to Him. In Jesus' name, amen.